Hello brothers and sisters. Today's video is going to have a very specific title. It's going to be entitled, Moses and Elijah will be killed on Shushan Purim. And as we get into the video, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about by comparing scripture with scripture. Um, Moses and Elijah, of course, are the two witnesses that are going to come. They represent the law and the prophets. They appear together at the very last part of Malachi, chapter 4, as well as on the Mount of um, Transfiguration. Moses, of course, represents the law that was handed down to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Oreb, in Saudi Arabia. I think in Saudi Arabia it's called Jabal al-Laws or something like that. and. Then, of course, Elijah represents the prophets. We were already told that Elijah is going to return. It's expected. Um, and they will be the ones who will prepare the way for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed eternal Son of God. And these two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, they will die at the end of their 1260-day ministry and be resurrected and go back into heaven and, it, and their death is going to occur on Shushan Purim. Now some of you may wonder how I can be so sure about that and we're going to get into the scripture. Uh, but first I need to clear up a couple of things. Um, in, a previous, in a previous video I stated that this year's uh, seven years from, from the Feast of Trumpets to seven years later at the Day of Atonement is exactly 2,550 days. It is, that's correct. I also stated that the, that the amount was off by a couple of days on starting in 2025. I was wrong. And I'm more than happy to admit my error. Um, I forgot to take into account a couple of uh, leap days and when that is done, everything works out perfectly. Two years in a row, that's kind of odd. And then I went into 2026 and it's off by about four weeks. So um, it doesn't always work that way. There's some years it does and some years it doesn't. I can tell you after a whole lot of math, it works for this year and the next one. Now, um, the other thing that I said that was not correct was the ministry ends when they die. It ends when they're resurrected and goes into heaven. And I'm going to tell you what kind of threw me off because it says that when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now a testimony is they speak words, they testify to the truth, they're witnesses, that's what they do. And of course they're witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Their testimony ends, but their witness doesn't really end because it is witnessed of the whole world that they see their bodies in the street. Even that is a witness. And their resurrection and ascension into heaven, you better believe that is a witness and a testimony too. But what happens is there's no more recorded words from the time Moses and Elijah are killed, which God allows it. For 1260 days, they have withstood Satan and his minions and, and all of this and uh, the coming Antichrist, they've opposed them, um, all these wicked rulers. But whenever, whenever they arise from the dead, it says, and after three days and in half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Now, friends, that's the same thing that we're going to hear. We are going to hear, Come up hither. Okay? I guarantee it. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, straight away, right after the church age ends, we hear, Come up hither. And you know what? We're going to listen to that voice. We're going to come up hither. And it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be joyous. Way up there in the air, that's where the meeting place is. And I know there's a lot of people that hate the rapture. Well, I pity them uh, because the rapture is wonderful. It's a blessed hope. And um, Jesus Christ is going to rescue his bride from this wicked, evil world and put us in heaven away from all of it. 
and we get to rest and uh, enjoy fellowship and all of those wonderful things in a new glorified body that never decays, never rots, never has an ache or a pain. Right now I'm dealing with lower back pain and I normally don't talk about my own issues but um, it's going to be nice to not have those aches and pains anymore. So um, I was incorrect about that and once, once I calculated all the days and I know exactly when their 1260 days ends, both this year and the next year, it would be the Shushan Purim when they're killed. Now I'm going to get into some of the, the well, all, all of the stuff that correlates. And some of you, you know that I have said in years past for many years, that some of you who have listened for a long time, I've said something very important. When you're dealing with Revelation, be assured that it's all happened somewhere else. It's drawn from the rest of the Word of God. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and this book is the Word of God. And Jesus Christ himself is called the Word of God. He is both the Word and the Son simultaneously for all of eternity. He is not the Word who became the Son. That's a false teaching, incarnational sonship. Uh, some erroneously teach that and lead others astray. I've seen numerous people led astray with that wicked doctrine. Um, but he is the Word of God, and this is the Word of God, the Bible. It's written down. And whenever you see things in Revelation, it comes from somewhere else. It might be hidden, okay? But if you diligently seek the Lord and you study and compare Scripture with Scripture, the Holy Spirit teaches you. Um, he says, you have no need that any man should teach you. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. And then whenever someone who teaches the truth, uh, and, and not one of those people that has itching ears that, you know, they heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears, um, that's a whole bunch. Then the Holy Spirit bears witness of that truth, the Holy Spirit living in you and it is received because it is the truth because a saint a true saint rejoices in the truth they love to hear the truth um, it gives them joy to know the truth and to learn and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the lord jesus christ so we're going to compare scripture with scripture and i'm going to show you because this is not just one time it's twice and I have to tell you, though, that not every seven-year period, beginning with a Feast of Trumpets, is going to result in the 2,550 days at specific times. But I had forgotten to take into account um, a couple of leap days in 2028 and 2032 for that seven-year set. So. I think somehow the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ plays a huge role in this and um, that time of Christ on this earth when he came to uh, as the Son of God to become the Son of Man and to fill the will of the Father to die on the cross for our sins and uh, to be buried to rise gloriously victoriously on the third day um, all of this fulfills Bible prophecy and it's it's important to understand that by comparing scripture with scripture we can learn things and the Lord said surely he does nothing without revealing it to his servants the prophets and Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy and as we see that day approaching and we study more we can see how things are coming together Israel has just about finished with Gaza and now the IDF is looking to deal with uh, Lebanon. And Lebanon, I don't think, really wants the war, but they're getting goaded into it by Iran. And there will be a war, mark my words. Um, we're, we're already in the very beginnings of the Psalm 83 war. Uh, the full war, I don't think, has been triggered yet. Israel is dealing with Gaza. It's just about cleaned up. But everybody's turning against Israel. That's important because that's exactly what's going to happen. I've already dealt with this in the Gog Magog series and my Prophecy Timeline series. Um, Ezekiel 38, 39, the people of the West, they're on the sidelines and they say, Hast thou come to take a spoil? But they don't get involved. God doesn't want them to, okay? 
You got to understand that. God is setting up this whole thing to, to undermine and destroy all these enemies and to put them down because all these kingdoms, they're going to be weakened and destroyed and they're all going to become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So God has already got a plan. He's doing it all. And in the process, he's going to redeem a people unto himself, the, the Jewish people that he, he made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob many millennia ago. And he will fulfill his promises. He's not done with them. That's why this 70th week of Daniel, which has not been completed yet, is called um, the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week, which is a period of seven years. The tribulation will last exactly 2,550 days. That's two sets of 1,260 days plus a 30-day time in the middle of it uh, to transition from the death and resurrection and ascension of Moses and Elijah and the beginning of, of the Antichrist reign, which begins during Passover week. And I've suspected that for a long time, but once I sat down and looked at the numbers and went to the calendar and counted how many days for this year and how many days for the next and the next and the next. Where is the 1260 days in? That stops. Then go from the, go backwards from the other uh, Day of Atonement when the Lord comes in the second coming and vanquishes all his foes, sets up his throne in Jerusalem and rules the earth with a rod of iron. So you work backwards from that and there's a 30 day period in there. Now, like I said, that doesn't work in every single group of years. But it does for these next two. Um, there would be uh, a time when Moses and Elijah are um, killed during Shushan Purim, and it works for both, both years, as well as um, rising from the dead and going into heaven. So Moses and Elijah, after they rise from the dead, there's nothing else where it's recorded that Moses and Elijah say anything. They just raise, they're on their feet, fear falls upon everybody. And this is probably on, on television at this point. Now, I think by the end of the tribulation, uh, technology is gonna be obliterated. And I don't see technology carrying over into the millennium. I think we all need a break. I really do. Nobody's going to be traveling to Jerusalem to take a selfie with the Lord Jesus. It's just not happening. Uh, so we're going to compare some scripture with scripture. And this is so fascinating. And I did cover this in some detail in a previous video. But I, I want to cover it, this particular thing by itself. But I also wanted to correct a couple of things from before. Um, where I was discussing um, next year's seven year period and how I thought I was off by two days but I forgot to add leap days. So with that being said let us look at Revelation chapter 11 and we're going to compare that with the book of Esther. Now before I get into reading the scripture there's something I need to say. There are eight feasts mentioned in the Word of God. Seven of them the Lord gave. He says they are my feasts. Okay, He has a purpose for each of those feasts. So first of all, um, I want to address somebody who said, well, he came on Pentecost, or the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, and Pentecost is going to get fulfilled, and we're going to go on a future Pentecost. No, we're not. We're going on a Feast of Trumpets. Now, this person also said, that there's not going to be any gap, seven year gap, um, between those because all the first four feasts were fulfilled all in the same year. That's true. The death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then his ascension into heaven, and then the giving of the Holy Spirit all occurred within less than two months' time. Done. It's all fulfilled. However, this time, there is a pattern in scripture that shows that there can be one day for one year, such as found in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, I believe. But I'm not going to go there right now. But nonetheless, you have the first of Tishri, 
and then the second of Tishri, those are set aside for the Feast of Trumpets. Why two days? Okay, two witnesses, does that sound familiar? Two witnesses have to come and they have to verify that they see the new moon. Okay, so until the new moon is spotted, they don't verify it. But if it doesn't happen the first day, it's automatically going to happen the second day. Um, it's automatically celebrated then. So it's a two-day feast. That's how it's done. Now, the Day of Atonement is Tishri 10, the 10th day of that month, of the seventh month. Okay? Now, in between 1 and 2 and 10, there's seven days. They call it the uh, Days of Awe. And that seven days represents the seven years between the Feast of Trumpets rapture and at the end of the tribulation at the second coming, the Day of Atonement, when the children of Israel will mourn. They will look upon him whom they've pierced and they will mourn as one for their only son. And the Lord is going to come and fight a battle. The Lord of hosts is going to arise out of his place and he's going to come down from heaven and we get to come with him. I, I don't know that we're in the battle. I can't find that anywhere. But nonetheless, um, if all we're going to be is cheerleaders for the Lord to do his work, then so be it. You know, whatever God has planned for us, just fine. But he will succor the Jews and help them. That's what succor means. It means to aid or to help. And he will come and help them, and they will fight in Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo, and defeat all the enemies. It's going to be a very gruesome time. Uh, blood up to the horses' bridles, the Bible says. But midway through the tribulation, towards the mid part, uh, Moses and Elijah will be killed and their bodies will be left laying in the streets for three and a half days. The spirit of life comes into them and they're taken into heaven in a cloud. And I believe that cloud is witnesses of, of uh, people. Now, let's look at some specific uh, verses here. So, these are the two olive trees, and you find that reference back in Zechariah. And the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. So nobody's going to mess with Israel the first three and a half years. God is going to intervene. Um, God is going to help them in, in all these early wars and, and defeat the enemies because these are God's enemies. And God... God wants to turn the hearts of the people of Israel to him. Not all will believe, but there will be a great uh, time of, of turning to the Lord and, and trusting in him. Because he said, he said, you will not see me again until they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're going to have to say that, and the religious leaders are going to have to acknowledge him and be willing to give up their seat of power. So far they haven't. And to this day, sadly, their eyes are blinded. There is a veil over their heart, as Paul says in Romans. But continuing on, this is Moses and Elijah, and it's very uh, typical of what Moses and Elijah did. They have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. That's Elijah, certainly. And have power over waters to turn them to blood, that would be Moses, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So they have free reign to do all these things and they're going to protect Israel. Uh, and nobody can harm them until the end of their ministry. They have, they have things to do and they're going to get it done. During the course of that time there will be a temple built, a new temple, and there will be worship and sacrifice once again. Now, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, years ago, there was this Hanyak, uh, this bad teacher. I, his name was Tex Mars, and he was so anti-Jewish. And he, everything in scripture that he could turn against them, he would. And it says, and he used this about 
see they're just Sodom and they're Egypt um, that's how they behave but God has other plans because you know what he says about Jerusalem he said it's the apple of his eye whoever touches Jerusalem touches the apple of his eye that is where he put his name there and Jerusalem is going to be a great city it's going to be the greatest city in the world uh, to him to the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to be the center of the world is Jerusalem so the Lord Jesus has great plans for that city and there's always going to be some Bible chopper uppers and scripture twisters that are going to try to uh, twist things up and make things look bad. But God has a plan. He's not done with Israel yet. Now, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, realize the complexity of this. Everybody's going to see, okay, all over the world. That would have to be some kind of television, okay? shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves and they now here's the key part right here verse 10 this is very important and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth so now whenever you look at 2550 days and you know it's from feast of trumpets to Day of Atonement seven years later, everything falls into place. They have to be killed on Shushan Purim. And Shushan Purim is supposed to be a day of great celebration where the Lord helps uh, the Jews defend against their enemies. And in, in one time there, they slaughter 75,000 uh, people that meant to do them harm, even in Shushan, in the palace. And that's why you have Shushan Purim, which can only be celebrated in a walled city. And according to the rabbis and such, only Jerusalem qualifies for that. So that's where it's celebrated. It's celebrated on another day, uh, the next day. So here we see the actions of the people on the earth, the wicked people. Oh, they're happy to get rid of Moses and Elijah because now what happens is getting these two prophets out of the way and all the power that they wielded and nobody was going to get in their way. Nobody's going to stop them. Now with them gone, they come in like a flood to, to attack the Jews. And what happens? Jesus says, pray not that your uh, flight be in winter or on the Sabbath. They're to get out of Jerusalem. Don't even look back. Don't take anything out of your house. Get to the wilderness. And God has a place, of course, in the wilderness for the children of Israel and to prepare them and to keep them for 1260 days, which is the length of the Antichrist. And he will protect them there and preserve them because God always preserves his remnant and meanwhile though getting back to this I want you to notice uh, about three different things here they shall rejoice make merry send gifts to one another okay that's important now we're going to go back to the original um, Shushan Purim this one was created by man but God honored it and um, just like when David wanted to build a temple, um, God said, well, you shed too much blood, but I'm going to let Solomon build a temple unto me. Because at first, the Lord is like, when have I ever asked for a temple? You know, whenever I ever, when have I ever asked for a house to dwell in? But God knew David's heart, and it was in David's heart to do that, and it was good. Um, in fact, God said, David is, is a man after mine own heart. So there you go. Um, Let's turn back to Esther, the book of Esther. And there's going to be several different verses that we're looking at. Now I need to explain something else. Um, the twelfth month of the Jews is Adar. Every so often, every few years, and I can't tell you the exact years, but every so often they have to throw in a, a second Adar, Adar 2, or 2 Adar, however they call that. But they have to do another Adar month to make everything line back out again. Otherwise, eventually you're going to be celebrating uh, fall feasts in the spring and spring feasts back in the winter, and it's going to be a big mess. So to keep the calendar lined out with our calendar, because they were on 30-day months and 360 days, um, they followed the lunar calendar 
they have to add this extra month to get things back into um, the proper seasons. So, understanding that, um, you have sometimes you will have um, Passover in April, sometimes in March. That's because these things get adjusted. So, one thing that I forgot to cover, real quick, is the, the people that said, oh, well, Jesus is going to come back on Pentecost. Well, he already fulfilled Pentecost. If he's going to fulfill Pentecost again, now you're saying he's going to fulfill uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits again. No, Jesus died once for all. Those things are not going to happen again. They're in the past, they're history, they've been fulfilled. And we can look back and see they're fulfilled. And on that basis, we can say, the future feasts are going to be fulfilled. And some will say, okay, well, I get that, but that's just for the Jews. Did Jesus not die for the sins of the whole world? Have we not been grafted in? Of course we have. Have uh, we not understood that Isaiah said that, that um, the Gentiles would come in too and the Gentiles would be saved and there's salvation for the Gentiles? Of course. So these feasts, the proper application is, understand this, the proper application of these feasts is when I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I have been buried and I've been resurrected. A new creature. See? See how we're tied to that? It's for us too. It's not just for the Jews. God used the Jews to show it to the whole world. It is it is through the Jews and through the the writing down of God's word and preserving it that now Gentiles are saved too. We see uh, the feasts are not just for the Jews. In fact, in many ways, right now, we have more understanding of it than the Jews do. They just do vain repetition. Uh, many of them don't understand the true meaning of it because they've rejected Jesus as their Messiah. But I can assure you, one of these days, they will not. So, no, Jesus will not come again on Pentecost. I've, I've seen others say, uh, well, the calendar's off a bit. He's going to come September 17th or 18th. No, that's harvest moon. That's not new moon. He will, he will come on the new moon, just like the Bible says. I've gone over this in many videos, and there's plenty of, of videos to watch on this. But this is specifically dealing with the Feast of Purim, Purim Shushan, okay? Shushan Purim. Now, let me read some of this. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan. That's the palace, okay, where the king was. So they had to fight for their lives there. But on the prey, they laid not their hand. You notice they didn't take no plunder off of these folks. They killed them, but they didn't like rob their bodies or anything vile like that. They just defended themselves, defended their own lives. And they stood against them by defending themselves. Now, they rejoiced because God gave them deliverance, okay? They had a good reason to rejoice, not like the wicked people coming up here one of these days where they rejoice over Moses and Elijah being dead and gone. No, they rejoiced because God intervened and spared them and saved them and gave them the ability through Esther petitioning the king. and. The king apparently was smitten with her and her beauty because he pretty much said, you can have whatever up to half of my kingdom. So God always does that in the history of the Jews. He places the right person there at the right time, just like with Daniel. And there's other examples, many examples, where they're there at the right time to get the job done. And then of course you have wise Mordecai instructing his niece um, that he had adopted as a daughter, Esther, who ascends the throne to replace Vashti, who um, did not do well with the king. He was not pleased. So he found a new queen, and that was in Esther. So he pretty much wanted to do whatever Esther liked, and that's what she needed done. So the, the wicked Haman and his bunch, they had been hung, and, and the king had said unto Esther, the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace and the 10 sons of Haman 
What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition, and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further, and it shall be done? So uh, he was willing to help her however she needed it, and to help uh, God's people. You, you see, the devil wants to destroy all the Jews. That's his, his role. And sadly, there's a lot of folks that want to help him because they're the children of disobedience. But God, on the other hand, he always puts somebody there, uh, divine providence, if you will, to protect and preserve the Jews uh, because God's not going to allow his people to be destroyed because then his word would be no good. If, if he couldn't keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to Moses and, and the children of Israel, he would not be the God he is. So when he speaks, his word doesn't come back void. It's going to be fulfilled. He will preserve them. Even through the terrible time of the tribulation, a third of them are preserved to go into the kingdom. Now, But the other Jews, verse 16 of Esther 9, I'm sorry if I did not tell you the chapter, but it's, it's chapter 9 of Esther. Okay, that's where we're at. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand, but they laid not their hands on the prey. So they didn't plunder these folks. Um, they killed them, defended themselves, and that was it. On the thirteenth day of the month Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same, rested they and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Now see, there's rejoicing there. God preserved our lives, we're happy, rejoicing. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the thirteenth day thereof, and on the fourteenth thereof, and on the fifteenth day of the same, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and fasting, and a good day, and of sending portions one to another. So notice it's different if it's a walled city. And we're talking about Jerusalem, which is the only one, according to the rabbis, that qualifies. So we're talking about Jerusalem in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 11, where the Lord was crucified. So we know that. Even though it doesn't spell out Jerusalem, it gives us plenty of clues that can just hit us in the head with it because it's obvious after reading other scripture that it's Jerusalem. So they celebrate after the others. Now, listen to this. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions one to another. And then you go down to verse 22. And the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day, which is Adar, the twelfth month of the year, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. You see the purity of this feast? You see how it was celebrated? It was in true biblical spiritual fashion of just being grateful to God and grateful for life and for him preserving them and protecting them. So what do they do? They send portions and gifts one to another. But look how twisted it is with the world's version. Same thing over in Revelation. This is what gives us the clues. Notice about the portions and gifts. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, there's the rejoicing, and making merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So that feast will get celebrated again correctly the right way one of these days. But once again, it's something that the devil perverts and twists. Um, that's what he does. But originally they sent gifts to the poor and one another. Um, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which they which was turned unto them from joy sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another in gifts to the poor so it's important to see that that, that is where that came from wherefore 
They call these days Purim, after the name of Pur, which literally means a lot, okay? Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them, the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. So yes, the Jews came up with it, but God honors them. He preserves their life because he loves these people. Um, Christ died for, for the sins of the whole world. And we know it's very sad that the, the Jews in, in the, his time of his crucifixion, they rejected him and said, uh, you know, do away with him. We have no king but Caesar, but they will someday say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So that's how it's celebrated. And we have all the clues that we need, the same components, uh, the same pattern from Esther is lifted right up and put in Revelation. So they rejoice, make merry, send gifts one to another. Over here, uh, verse 22 of chapter 9, they make them days of feasting and joy, sending gifts and portions one to another. So the pattern is the exact same. And also, whenever you understand that the tribulation has a starting point and an ending point, and you understand that um, there's exactly 1260 days, I mean exactly, not one day off, okay? No variableness or shadow of turning with our Heavenly Father. Not one day off, either way. It's spot on. And 1260 days of rule for the Antichrist. But Daniel in chapter 12 gives us that other 30 days. Um, and that comes in the middle. Now it can't go on beyond that because of the simple fact that Jesus Christ comes and that's that there is another 45 days that uh, after the second coming that deals with uh, the judging of the nations and the setting up of his kingdom uh, folks we're talking about the coronation of the greatest king okay that mankind will ever see the coming King, uh, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and who rules from his throne in Jerusalem, his great glorious throne over all the nations of the earth. And they come to him and they give gifts to the Jews and to him, and they worship at his feet. They come and pray before him, and uh, the Lord of glory is there, tabernacling. See, that's the seventh feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. He tabernacles with man. and. He does this for 1,000 years, and then we go into eternity, and all wickedness is put away forever. But these feasts are going to be in order, and they're going to be very specific. And the last three won't be all fulfilled in the same year. There's going to be a, a small gap, seven-year gap, between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And then after that, it is going to be the millennial reign in the same year that starts. That's obvious. Um, but we have patterns in Scripture. We can trust what the Bible says. Um, and it is obvious that Moses and Elijah would be killed on Shushan Purim. And they will be resurrected. And that is the end of their 1260 days. There's still a witness even laying there in the street. And the words of their testimony end because the Bible doesn't record them saying anything else. They don't stand up on their feet and say, folks, it's coming now. Now you've had it, your goose is cooked. They don't say anything. They just, the Bible says they hear come up hither and they go up to heaven. They've done said all they're gonna say. Now it's up to um, the Antichrist to try to consolidate his, his position of power and he's going to try to destroy the Jews and take over the whole world and regarding the Antichrist taking over the whole world I believe the Bible teaches that there's other kingdoms and while his spiritual father the devil because he's of the children of disobedience he's the man of lawlessness um, while he has influenced the world over the Antichrist kingdom is going to be the revived Roman Empire and the reason I say that is because 
the Bible speaks very clearly of the kings of the east coming over the dried up Euphrates River to come to Jerusalem to attack in the towards the very end of the tribulation period. So we can see that Moses and Elijah, the two prophets, representing the law and the prophets, are going to be killed on Shushan Purim and they're going to rise from the dead. That will conclude their 1260 days. And by comparing scripture with scripture, we see what happened. Everything is there for a reason. You know, some folks have said, oh, Esther is a nice story, but I don't know how it applies to anything. Folks, it does. God draws from all scripture. He pulls it from everywhere. And I said this a long time ago. I understood that concept even before I could tell these things that I'm telling you today. I just, I just knew that the revelation of Jesus Christ culminates everything else. Now, some things are obvious. You know, these plagues that come, you can say, well, that happened in Egypt. And uh, yeah, this plague of darkness, that happened in Egypt. And other things um, that we see came from other books. But sometimes these things are a bit hidden. And by comparing scripture with scripture, there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed. So until next time, God bless you all. Take care.